Okie dokie. All right. So I'm back. Hopefully now, okay, we have the, the slide there and hopefully I have the streaming software working well so that we can broadcast this, broadcast this on YouTube, excuse me, uh, demonstrating the pituitary slides. Okay. So I'm back. All right. So let me minimize this and we'll present from beginning. Okay. All right. So as I had just mentioned, and I'm going to go back through this, uh, tonight I'm talking about pituitary tumors. I'm Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And talking about pituitary tumors because the staff thought it was a good idea and because they thought it was a good idea. Uh, I thought it was also a good idea because we have quite a few uh, individuals who have pituitary tumors that either come into the practice knowing that they have them or where we find them. And so pituitary tumors are actually pretty common. Uh, I didn't mention this, but around, they say that around 17% of the population has a pituitary tumor at any given time. So the prevalence is estimated at 17%, which seems insanely high. Uh, but that is based on radiographic and uh, autopsy data. So some individuals are going to have really tiny adenomas on their pituitary, which is probably why that statistic is so high. I thought it was a mistake, but it seems to be cited throughout the literature. So here I have a diagram of the pituitary. Uh, for those of you on Facebook, I'm doing the YouTube live so you can see the slides, hopefully. Uh, this is my second go around at it tonight. But anyways, here I have a, a picture of the pituitary gland from the Principles of Neuroscience, uh, fifth edition, where you can see there are two portions to the pituitary. There's the anterior pituitary, referred to as the adenohypophysis, and then there's the posterior pituitary, referred to as the neurohypophysis. The anterior pituitary is responsible for hormones involved with prolactin, uh, growth hormone, your adrenal glands, your thyroid gland, and also your gonads, which in females are the ovaries and males are the testicles. So that's your anterior, anterior pituitary. Your posterior pituitary or neurohypophysis is very much involved with um, what's referred to as vasopressin and antidiuretic hormone, which are synonymous, as well as oxytocin. And basically vasopressin is really important when it comes to pituitary surgery, because sometimes when they do surgery on the pituitary, individuals can develop diabetes insipidus, which is a lack of antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. So, moving on, here you can see this prevalence of 17% cited here in this journal article from Neuro-Oncology. And the prolactinomas are the most common form of functional pituitary adenoma. So prolactinomas are where the anterior pituitary secretes excessive prolactin. What is prolactin? Prolactin is a hormone that's important for breast milk production. And so if you know someone who all of a sudden starts having what we refer to as galacteria, where they're making breast milk and they're not nursing a baby, then they may have a prolactinoma. Other features can include um, Irregular menses for females, for men it can be signs of low testosterone or erectile dysfunction. I'll go through that in a little more detail. But the prolactin is secreted from the lactotrophs of the anterior pituitary gland. The lactotrophs are, are inhibited by dopamine. So think of dopamine as being the brake pedal for the lactotrophs. Now, conditions where dopamine may be low include if someone has a prolactinoma growing the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland is like a grape with a stalk connected to it. So if the grape has this growth on it and that's compressing the stalk, so to speak, or stretching the stalk, that actually reduces the dopaminergic inhibition of the prolactinoma. And as a result, that can cause the prolactinoma to grow even more. Also important is the element of neuroleptic medications. These are medications used for psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, which are designed to inhibit dopamine uh, signaling, and those can also facilitate excessive prolactin secretion. 
So as I mentioned, uh, prolactinomas are the most common pituitary tumor. They're more common in women. Uh, features in women include amenorrhea, so not having menstrual cycles or irregular menses, uh, headaches, fertility issues, galacteria, that's the production of breast milk. In men, it can be premature ejaculation, erectile dysfunction, low testosterone. Also, galacteria can occur in men. And so uh, this is why I think it's important to test prolactin in any man suspected of having low testosterone. <clears throat> it's not super common, but it does happen, and it's not something we want to be missed. Um, typically, prolactinomas are larger in men at the time of diagnosis than in women. And we want to watch out for the hook effect. The hook effect can fool you basically uh, where in some individuals you have to dilute down the prolactin assay into a factor of 10 in order to actually see the high prolactin levels. And medical therapy includes dopamine agonists like capergoline or bromocryptine. And radiation versus surgery is an important topic. Basically, with prolactinomas, most people are going to approach it medically first, meaning they're going to use medications like capergoline. Capergoline is the most common medication used for prolactinomas. But there are certain situations where the medication therapy either is not working, there can be, it's very rare, but you can have some malignant prolactinomas. Also, some people just don't want to take the medication. So they say, okay, I just want it cut out. And so those individuals may go see a neurosurgeon who focuses on pituitary disorders. Um, a small percentage of these prolactinomas are refractory to meds and soon to be mother has a prolactinoma. What should she do? Basically, uh, that's a critical question because the medications used to treat these lots of times can cause uh, infertility. And so, uh, the prolactinoma can grow during pregnancy, and so that's why some women who have prolactinomas will have a surgery before getting pregnant. And then that's just an article on aggressive and malignant prolactinomas. They're rare, but they do occur. Growth hormone secreting adenomas. So these are more common in males. So what's the, who's the individual who may... Um, ring a bell, so to speak, for having a growth hormone secreting adenoma, it would be Andre the Giant. And so when we have excessive secretion of growth hormone before the growth plates are closed, we will have gigantism. So these are the individuals who are really, really tall typically, and they have a lot of big peripheral features. That's what acromegaly means. Uh, acromegaly is the enlargement of these peripheral aspects of the body, like the hands and the feet or the tongue or the brow, um, after the growth plates are closed. And so that's what acromegaly is. Facial changes, as I mentioned, they tend to sweat a lot. Uh, patients with growth hormone secreting adenomas can have carpal tunnel syndrome. They tend to be insulin resistant or have prediabetes. <laughs> And they can have early mortality, unfortunately. It takes a long time to diagnose these typically because um, if you're a fully grown adult, you may not notice that your shoe size is changing subtly or that your tongue is enlarging. And so it may take a while to make the diagnosis. Now, growth hormone um, is secreted by somatotrophs in your pituitary, and somatotrophs are inhibited by somatostatin. So somatostatin analogs like ocreotide, if I remember correctly, is the most common one, is the medication given to individuals with GH secreting adenomas if there's a problem with the adenoma to help shut off that excessive growth hormone production. Uh, surgery is the first line of treatment for most people. And again, as I mentioned, growing shoe size and growing tongue. The blood tests most commonly run are an insulin-like growth factor one, and an oral glucose tolerance test. The IGF-1 is kind of the gold standard. Okay, and then ACTH secreting adenomas are really important because Cushing's disease is something that can really affect an individual's life. What is Cushing's disease? Cushing's disease is classically defined, it's more commonly in females than males, 
where there's what we refer to as a moon face. So there's a rounding of the face and there can be what's referred to as the dowager's hump. So there can be a hump on the mm, vertebral prominence area, which you would think of back here. So dowager's hump, moon faces, central obesity. So these are individuals who have a really big belly. They have a tendency for purple scars on their abdomen, referred to as purple cicatrix. And um, so this may present as a person coming in who's trying to lose weight, but they're not able to lose weight. And they don't know why, and they're gaining weight around their midsection. Most of the adenomas are small, and they may not be seen on MRI scans, and so that can fool people. So you have to do a bunch of testing, like evening cortisol salivary samples or 24-hour urinary cortisol, and then there's the other tests like the um, suppression test, the dexamethasone suppression test, or the CRH stimulation test. CRH is corticotropin releasing hormone. There are other pituitary tumors like TSH secreting adenomas. These are not nearly as common, and I forgot to mention the, st the statistics. So if you look at functional pituitary adenomas, prolactinomas account for like, not like they account for approximately 70 to 80 percent of the functional pituitary adenomas. Your growth hormone secreting adenomas account for 13 to 20 percent of the functional adenomas. Your ACTH secreting adenomas are around 5 to 10 percent, and then TSH secreting adenomas are around 1 to 2 percent, and, um, and then you can have the gonadotroph adenomas, which is maybe around 1 percent, I believe. So a TSH secreting adenoma typically manifests as someone having hyperthyroidism, and I believe they have a swollen thyroid in that situation. Gonadotroph adenomas can lead to high estrogen, in a female, high testosterone in a male, or low testosterone in a male, uh, ironically. With these pituitary tumors, we want to be aware of something called pituitary apoplexy, which is where you can develop basically a stroke or a hemorrhage within the pituitary gland where there's this adenoma, which can lead to sudden loss of pituitary function, which is really important because you basically can't live without cortisol. So it becomes a medical emergency uh, diabetes insipidus is also dangerous. So these individuals lots of times have sudden vision changes. They may have a sudden headache um, because that pituitary gland sits next to your optic chiasm, which is basically where all the information from your retinas goes back and then crosses. And that's at the chiasm and that pituitary sits under the chiasm. So pituitary lesions can cause visual effects. Also your cavernous sinus, which is where a lot of your cranial nerves going to the eyes are located is very close by. So sudden visual changes and headaches requires emergency medical assessment. Familial conditions can also cause pituitary tumors. So tonight's a little sciencey and it's a little kind of dry, but um, you know, with pituitary adenomas, it's basically pretty straightforward and we're not talking about so much autoimmunity involving the pituitary, though there is discussion about autoimmunity affecting the pituitary for some thyroid conditions, but we won't go into that tonight. So I hope this helped. I'll be back hopefully tomorrow with one or two broadcasts. Uh, we'll see how much progress I make tomorrow, and I hope you all have a, a lovely Thursday night. It's late, and uh, I will talk to you later. Oh, great. All right. And then YouTube's still going live. I have a question reference to your taxi video. Okay, so I'll, I'll come back and answer that. And uh, thank you, everyone who joined. I'll just put a little comment in there. Who joined? Have a great night. Okay. All right. And I'll end the stream there.